One of the errors that diverse education can dispel is the false belief that one's own tradition is the only one that is capable of self-criticism or universal aspiration. The idea that people of different cultures actually think differently has been slow to find its way into the heart of Western philosophy. Over the past century or so, anthropologists, sociologists, psychologists, and cognitive scientists have often examined this issue and compared the results. However, as James Hasek, an American philosopher of religion notes, until recently, the majority of philosophers in the West have exempted themselves from the debate, often assuming that philosophy's kind of thinking is universal and transcultural. Others have claimed to the contrary that philosophy is so distinctively Western and enterprise that there's little point to look for it elsewhere. In either case, non-Western philosophy is dismissed as an oxymoron. In the article, Philosophy's Paradoxical Parochialism, The Reinvention of Philosophy as Greek, Robert Bernasconi exposes that the dogma that proper philosophy begins in ancient Greece and was developed solely in the Western tradition, something that still largely shapes our philosophy department's curricula in conference programs, was actually first formulated in the late 18th century. This mode of thinking abruptly replaced the long-standing recognition that ancient Greeks had drawn on Egyptian and other Eastern sources, and that different yet recognizably philosophical thinking can be found in India, China, and elsewhere. What is one to make, Bernasconi provocatively asks, of the apparent tension between the alleged universality of reason and the fact that its upholders are so intent on localizing its historical instantiation. This is what he calls the paradox of philosophy's parochialism. Simon Critchley, on behalf of continental philosophy, called for a robust philosophical pluralism that recognizes that philosophy has more than one tradition, and those assertions of philosophical exclusivism result at best in parochialism and at worst in intellectual imperialism. This dominant belief has resulted in Japanese studies that have rarely focused specifically on the philosophical dimensions of the culture, typically treating them only in the background or emergence of scholarly works in literature, religion, politics, and intellectual history or the arts. This lack of research and attention impresses people that, compared with other civilizations, Japan has not been very much engaged in philosophical reflection, analysis, and argument. Instead, the romanticized image of Japan is either haiku, zen gardens, tea ceremony, or anime and manga. Behind those phenomena, however, stands powerful critical traditions of philosophy. So a focus on Japanese philosophy can broaden and deepen not only our understanding of philosophy, but also of Japan. Therefore, in the following series of lecture, I will not only describe the thoughts and ideas developed by Japanese philosophers, but also engage with the issues with which these thinkers struggled. I also aim to address viewers who are intrigued by the question of how culture and systematic thinking have interacted in a sophisticated literary tradition radically different from that of Western Europe. In doing so, I hope to exemplify one of the core philosophical values at the heart of these traditions, which lies not in the redescriptions, but creative engagement with the ideas of the old when placed in a literary context, namely that of anime. However, before I begin a new series on Japanese philosophy and subsequently philosophy of literature anime edition, I would like to first begin by giving a bit of context so that the people can understand why the series is shaped a certain way. So I would like all the listeners to just listen to this part cause I will not include this part in the future videos. There are currently two main traditions of philosophy in western countries. One is continental tradition and another one is analytic tradition. Philosophynow.org explains the difference between the two as. Analytic philosophy is concerned with analysis. Analysis of thought, language, logic, knowledge, mind, etc. Whereas continental philosophy is concerned with synthesis, synthesis of modernity with history, individuals with society, and speculation with the application. So basically, the difference between the two traditions is the methods they employ to deal with problems and arrive at a conclusion. Continental tradition is very popular on the European continent, and the analytic tradition is very popular in Anglo speaking countries and American influenced countries. I was educated in the analytic tradition, and one of the most common criticisms that we get is that which is simply too boring. Even though our content may be educational, it is not entertaining, so it puts off a lot of people and makes it seem as though we're just merely playing with semantics. It is a valid argument, but in our defense, we may come out this way because we are very deliberate in our word choice and tend to systematically analyze in detail. I understand that most of the viewers are unaware of what philosophy is, and some people who are aware just kind of know very mainstream philosophers like Nietzsche and Sartre. And they didn't receive proper education as I did, so it makes sense that they make mistakes, right? Some people say, who cares? We're on YouTube and not in the classroom, so why does it matter whether their information is like 100% correct? They just came here for entertainment. 
That may be true for some people, but personally, I don't think that the pursuit of entertainment should lead me down to a path where I start abandoning facts and logic and become like some people who just start making stuff up without proper readings and research. I don't want to sound elitist, and I'm certainly not trying to rag on other people, but when they talk about philosophy and instead of systematically analyze something and articulate complex arguments to present to the viewers, to give their opinions and make it seem like some famous philosophers support their claims by taking quotes out of context. So that is why you have to do a lot of research if you truly want to understand an idea, but when you try to simplify an idea too much and falsely present their arguments not intentionally, it gives the impression to many people that philosophy is just stating opinions. I certainly cannot agree that I would do a better job than they do, but I definitely don't want to go down the path of infotainment and misinformation. I think that YouTube is a good way to reach out to people around the world who do not have access to good education or just education at all. So if done correctly, I think these videos can be entertaining but also educational. As someone truly passionate about doing philosophy and living, learning and growing with it, I want to share the same fervor with those who are also interested in it and truly care about learning new things. Plus I have formal education so if I don't truly do philosophy and instead just start ranting or saying nonsense, I think I'll be doing a disservice to my colleagues and old professors. So the viewers, please let me know what you think and give me constructive feedback on how I'm doing, what I can do better, what you want to see more. As for why I'm starting this series on philosophy of literature with a focus on anime, that is because there aren't any classes that analyzes the themes and ideas discussed in anime shows. I received my education from a university that is ranked in the top 10 in the world, and I've also done summer schools at lesser known universities. And as far as my associates and are aware, colleges that offer classes on the philosophy of literature do not even remotely mention Eastern literature, let alone anime, as a form of literature. We know there are a lot of trashy animes out there, and the anime genre is still new, but there are also some good ones that don't shy away from some philosophical topics that we have been repeatedly discussing since ancient times. And anime as a medium is consumed by a lot of people around the world, so I think it is a bit silly to be analyzing Shakespeare, whose works we have been reading since we were in the middle school. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to structure the series on philosophy of anime, like the philosophy of literature class that we took in college. I will not format this anime philosophy series like a lecture, but rather make it like a discussion class between the TAs and the students, so it will be more laid back. And your job as a viewer is to watch the series first, before you watch the video, to know what I'm dealing with, because I will not spend half the video giving summary of the plot. But for the series on Japanese philosophy, I will format it like a lecture, the same way that I've been doing for other videos on the traditions of philosophy. Now let's get back to talking about Japanese philosophy. Japanese and Korean traditions of philosophy, when compared to other Asian traditions, present distinctive features. So in China and India, the two main sources of philosophical inspiration in Asia, there are distinctive sub-schools of philosophy, like how there are various Buddhist schools of philosophy that arose in China and India. However, in Japan, philosophers tend to adopt and adapt the works that have been proposed by different traditions of philosophy from China, India, and Western countries. Instead of division, they are mostly interested in the synthesis of thought into their own context since they have always been attuned to the intimate relations among culture, ways of thinking, and philosophical worldviews. Japanese philosophers also have not merely approached Western philosophy as a subject of historical and objective interest. Instead, they have taken their own critical stance, making their own adjustments and contributions in light of their own experience and intellectual history without an alien power forcibly imposing on the country their own religious worldview or philosophical theories. So some say that modern Japanese thinkers have typically filtered so much of Western philosophy through their own modes of thought, aesthetic feeling, and religious experience that great ideas have become transfigured, reoriented, and even radically inverted. Furthermore, they have also acquired skills in analyzing foreign ideas by examining the cultural assumptions behind them to determine their potential implications if they were to be adopted into their own culture. This acquisition can be witnessed in the transcendental view of Western philosophy that is reflected in Robert Carter's exploration of Japanese ethics, which he found to derive from elements of Confucian, Buddhist, and Shinto ethical traditions, but from a Japanese perspective. Japanese philosophers have charted a path toward becoming an ethical being and living an ethical life with a caring attitude toward the world, with a focus on the practice of ethics, in the cultivation of living, and being in the world that we are a part of. This feature of Japanese ethics can in fact be found in artistic practices, as Mara Miller, professor of pre-modern Japanese literature notes. Japanese ethics is concerned with a wider variety of experience and objectives than its western counterparts. Japanese aesthetics recognizes such experience as mono no aware, or awareness of the poignancy of things, 
and shibui, the aesthetic quality or astringency. These experiences often involve everyday objects and activities. One's ethical and aesthetic agency is revealed in the way we are and act in the world. Likewise, freedom for the Japanese people isn't freedom from nature, but is in fact an expression of nature. Nature is not only thought of as an object of study, but as a way of life. It is a way in which things, animals, plants, and people are, and freedom is found in the naturalness of our participation in nature. It is in a sense an achievement because one needs to practice being natural by intimately engaging oneself with the everyday world. One becomes responsive to one's surroundings, whether through a spontaneous compassionate act or a spontaneous artistic move by means of actualizing freedom. The Japanese focus on the realization of nature is given a soteriological character in Buddhism and Shinto. Dogen Kigen, often considered the most original and profound Zen thinkers from the 13th century, centralizes practice or enlightening engagement with the world. For Dogen, enlightenment is a matter of verifying, like making true and realizing, in the sense of actualizing, to authenticate what one truly is in one's practice. In such an engagement with the world, however, one is not to assert one's subjectivity, but rather to drop off the body-mind and openly and fully engage with the world. We must know that the Japanese in the compound Japanese philosophy does not refer to some hypothetical pure beginnings or unchanged cultural quality that is continuous throughout history, but to a specific way of blending cultural flows in which the later thinkers improve upon the works of the previous thinkers without necessarily biting by their ideology as the scholastics did. New ideas build on former ideas by expanding, modifying, or even rejecting them, and through this continuous process, schools of thought emerge and within these schools arises a community of thinkers who may agree or disagree, but always share common ground for. It is similar to J.L. Austin's arguments about language, responding to arguments from Bartrand Rousseau, Ludwig Wittgenstein. Similarly, it is the most natural to view that philosophy of Ogyu Sodai is a continuation of Confucian predecessors like Ito Jinsai and Hayashi Lazen. Therefore, in making such an explicit distinction, we should be careful of the labels and should not insist on the distinctiveness of Japanese philosophy, since such essentialization both overgeneralizes certain features and mischaracterizes the respective traditions.